Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I just cannot believe that this is happening. It is my 1000th interview. When I started this podcast in 2017, I didn't even think I was going to get past 10, but thanks to you, the people, and I'm not talking about just you fans out there who listen to this, but also the people who give me the time to talk to them, it is possible. Today, my 1,000th interview is Peter Albin, the bass player for Janis Joplin's band, the Big Brother and the Holding Company. I met Peter last October at Santa Rosa Comic Con, and he was a great guy. I met him and his drummer, Dave Getz, and um, I wanted him to come on the show right away, but I lost his contact info, but I found his wife on social media, and uh, we got the interview all set up, and it's going to be great talking to him. Uh, talk about, you know, the psychedelic period of San Francisco, and all the highs and lows that uh, he faced with Big Brother and the Holding Company, and then he joined Country Joe and the Fish, and I'll find all that stuff out. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Peter Albin. Hey, Peter. Welcome to the show, sir. Well, how you doing, Tony? I've been pretty good. You know, uh, I've been through some hardships in the last year, like everyone has, but other than that, I'm pretty good. 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 Yes. Yeah, I've, I've uh, yeah, had some problems uh, early on uh, this year with uh, just to have a, a bad cold, and it just has kept hanging on. Now, I think it's not a cold anymore. I think it's uh, part of my COPD stuff, and uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of nasal stuff. You know, it's just coughing. But, but uh, uh, my doctor says I don't have the COVID nineteen, even though I haven't gotten the test yet. Mm-hmm. But he says my my uh, symptoms are just like a, a regular cold or flu. So uh. I've had it for since March. You know, it's incredible. Yeah. I do nasal rinses and uh, uh, nasal sprays and. Uh, yeah, I, I know how it is. Yeah, I had a COVID test back in May because I was just dreadfully sick for about 72 hours. It was pretty bad, but I didn't have it, so thank God for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. So, anyway, I, my wife and I have both been laid off since March, so we're just spending most most of our time at home here. Yep, that's what we're doing too, you know. I'm just sitting here waiting for this whole clusterfuck to end, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. But um, I want to thank you for taking the time today, and um, I wanted to let you know on the air, you are my 1,000th guest. Wow. Yes. Yes. I didn't think I was going to get past 10 when I started this, and I'm just so grateful you talk to uh, I, I, honestly you'd have to go through my youtube channel because <laughs> i've got so many people on there i've talked to just everybody in the world of acting and music and stand-up comedy and so much stuff yeah yeah mostly entertainment stuff though right all entertainment yeah i'm not into really anything else um, Pretty cool stuff, yeah. yeah i'm not into politics or sports or any of that stuff so, going back what in... What do you want to talk oh, about today, uh, Tommy? Okay. So, going back in time, did you... Gravi- did you, did you what, at what age did you start gravitating toward music? Oh, jeez. Early on. There's a photograph of me with my thigh, with a ukulele, and I must have been like six years old. Yeah. Ukulele. That, was, yeah. That, was that your first instrument? Yeah. Pretty much so. I had a ukulele and a banjo uke, and then... When I was in school, I took violin mm-hmm. and didn't do very well at that. And I took clarinet and even did, did even worse. So I got back to stringed instruments. I started playing guitar, I guess, when I was 13. Wow. Yeah. How many instruments overall do you play? Well, basically, I just play bass. I don't play guitar too much anymore. Mm-hmm. And that's about it. Yeah, I don't play ukulele. Yeah, I don't even have one anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, that's not like an instrument that you play consistently, you know. No, no, but I mean, it's gained, gained popularity. I mean, I see a lot of people playing ukulele and playing ukulele well. Oh yeah, I, I saw Todd Rundgren. I think he did a whole show where he was playing his hits on ukulele, and um, that song of his, "Bang the Drum All Day," he called it uh, play, "Play the Ukulele All Day." <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty funny. Uh, do you remember the first album you ever bought? No, but I do remember the first 45 I ever bought, which was uh, a Perry Como song called Hot Diggity Dog Diggity. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember that song. Not big yet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I remember that song. How about the first concert you ever attended? Boy, that's, that's a tough one. Um... I really don't remember. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Wow. So, saw a lot of shows, you know, in my time, and been in a lot of shows. But, um, yeah, I was not like a, 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 a I want to say, a fan. Um, I would go to a lot of shows. Um, I just watched a lot of my favorite artists on television, and sometimes in the movies, you know. Mm-hmm. Are you bar- like, um, mm-hmm. Chuck Berry was in Rock, 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 an Alan Reed movie. I remember seeing that when I was young. Yep. Remember that. Um, and the girl can't help it with, with um, Richard Pennyman. <laughs> yeah. I just, I just interviewed Bill Haley Jr. His father was in a rock movie at that time. A, a, teen, a teen movie that had rock and roll. I can't remember the name of it. But um, yeah, they, were, they they had all those um, movies where they were putting all the the fifties rockabilly guys in them. I remember Eddie Cochran was was in one, and he did Twenty Flight Rock. Yeah, you remember that? Yeah. And then there was um, oh gosh, um, oh god, there was there was a lot of those uh, a lot of uh, artists that were not really popular, but they were you know kind of like supporting acts. Mm-hmm. Um, Gene Vincent was in the movie, I think. So that, oh, that was, yeah. The girl can't help, yeah. Uh, I just looked it up. He was in Rock Around the Clock, named after his own song, and Don't Knock the Rock. Those were the two Don't movies. Don't Knock the Rock, yeah. I didn't see those movies. So. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Are you uh, born and raised in San Francisco? Well, I was born in San Francisco and I lived there for two years as an infant and then uh, moved down to San Carlos, California, which is down the <laughs> peninsula about 25 miles. Yep. I lived there for about 10, ten years and then um, moved to Belmont, which is a city next, just yep. a little bit north of San Carlos. I lived there for, uh, again, about, about 10 years, 8 or 10 years. Uh, yeah, I'm born and raised in San Mateo. I lived in San Carlos for nine years, uh, up until 2013, and got to be there right at the end of San Carlos being a great place to live until they started doing projects there. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Well, I lived on the wrong side of the tracks when when my when I grew up there. Um, it was um, on the east side of the tracks. East side. But now that that whole area, I mean, it says all the homes are very expensive to be there. Um, and uh, I went there uh, several years ago to to, uh, to see my old home, and that has certainly changed. And and there was a school that was right on the other side of our fence, and that's gone. It's a bunch of big homes there now, and uh, it doesn't matter whether you're you know close to the tracks or not. You know those homes and. In San Carlos, generally very expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's insane. When my mother and I moved into our apartment in two thousand four, it was um, nine hundred a month. It was a one bedroom, nine hundred a month. And when we left, it was thirteen fifty. And then the last time we were there, it was over four thousand. Oh my God! Yes. Wow, that apartment, God, incredible. Insane. Well. It, my father bought this new tract home mm-hmm. in 1946 for 13000 Mm-hmm. 13000 uh, I'm sure it's way over 700000 now. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it's insane. Were you were you in a lot of bands in high school? Hardly any, because I was mostly into folk music at that time. There was a couple of people uh, that I found out later I had been in bands that were from my high school. Oh gosh, um, uh, something Beethoven, the Beethovens, I guess one group. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the guys that were there. The, the um, um, piano player or keyboard player for Journey was in a, in a local band down there. Greg Raleigh. Greg, yeah, Raleigh. Yeah. I can't remember the name of the band. Mm -hmm. And that was before Santana, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking like probably 1961 or 62. Yeah. So I was, I was, as far as groups go, I was involved with my brother and various people under the name of a folk music group called the Liberty Hill Aristocrats, and then later it was <laughs> the new Liberty Hill Aristocrats. <laughs> That's a great name. Yeah, we just looked at a map and picked out a name on a map. <laughs> Were you guys listening to the like the King the Kingston Trio a lot during that time? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we started listening to I want to say original versions of some of those songs that the Kingston Trio um, and other pop uh, folk groups were doing, and so we got more into I want to say ethnic or versions or original versions of these songs mm -hmm. um, like Tom Dooley you know um, yeah and I started getting into um, um, a, a little bit of ethnic blues and stuff but then I realized you know about maybe five years after doing the folk music stuff you know I've been growing been growing up listening to rock and roll music mm -hmm. uh, on, on the top 40 radio channels, KYA and KEWB and um, a couple others. And, and uh, you know, I mean, I was so into it that when I was in like seventh grade, I'd rush home from school yeah. uh, on, a, on a Friday to catch the, the new list that was coming out. Now, you could get a list from of the top 40s uh, singles, uh, from a record store, and uh, where you could just sit down, and you could write them, you listen to them, and write them down, which I did. You know, so yeah. I was I was really into it. So I realized uh, after the folk music thing that you know, basically, I had grown up on rock and roll music, and that was like more me than than uh, you know, uh, uh, Boylan Cabbage Down Boys or whatever, you know, some of the old folk songs that I was doing with my brother. Yeah. He continued to play folk music. I played, I played violin, banjo, guitar, yeah. and violin. And uh, uh, when I was in high school, I, 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 I turned on David Nelson to uh, folk music. And uh, he, he learned a lot from my brother. Uh, and uh, we would uh, go down to, uh, well, at one point we went down to... Uh, Pal Alto, because mm -hmm. we heard of this guitar player named Jerry Garcia, who <laughs> played for free at Kepler's bookstore on El Camino Real. Oh, yeah. And uh, we, at that time, had a, a little club that was called the, the Boar's Head. Mm -hmm. That was in San Carlos. It was uh, right on the San Carlos Avenue, right above what at that time was called the Carlos Bookstall. It's mm -hmm. no longer there. I mean, the building has been changed radically, but it was a um, old used bookstore uh, with a uh, what do you call it? A little uh, uh, balcony uh, that was closed off. But the balcony uh, was open to the street, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, anyway, we closed it up a little bit. It held like about twenty people. Mm -hmm. and so uh, on the, I think it was summer of 61 and 62, we uh, had these little shows. It was just volunteer. No one paid anybody for anything. You know, it was a pass the tip jar kind of thing. Yeah. We had you know, coffee for a dime. But people like Garcia and, and uh, Ron McCurran and a couple of others, people who were down, from, uh, down in Palo Alto would come up. Mm -hmm. uh, after we, we went down and, and introduced ourselves, you know, said, hey, come on up and play. You know, we can't pay you anything, but you know, it's a place to play. So they brought some of their friends and uh, fellow musicians. 
musicians, and uh, uh, we even had some electric guitar players there, and um, uh, guys playing, people playing auto harp and dulcimer and all sorts of folky kind of instruments. Um, but we had also some blues singers and players. Mm -hmm. uh, and eventually we moved to the uh, Jewish Community Center that was on Cherry Street, mm -hmm. close to downtown, about half a block away. Uh -huh. And we did that for, uh, for a summer. And uh, again, we had a lot of people from, from uh, Palo Alto area. Jerry Garcia must have had like two or three different named bands, you know, Black Mountain Boys and this one or that one. Mm -hmm. Um, out of that, Mother McCree's Uptown Jug Champions, and uh, you know, uh, a lot of his folk groups that he was, was into, and uh, um, Bob Hunter, uh, got some usual friendly with my brother. My brother even moved down to Palo Alto for a little while. Mm -hmm. That's seen down there. But, you know, for me, it was, it was just, you know, it was easy to play that kind of music, and uh, uh, I changed though, going back to, to blues and R and B and, and rock and roll when I went to college. Mm -hmm. Had a little group there. Yeah, I'm sure. Too... Moved... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. When I moved to San Francisco, that's when I started getting into rock and rock and roll and bass playing. Uh, that's a whole other story. The story of 1090 Page Street, <laughs> uh, which was a big Victorian house on. Uh, uh, page in the uh, Broderick Street. Anyway, you know, all the, a lot of stuff I'm telling you has been written down. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff in books. Well, pretty much most of it's uh, factual. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a very interesting transition, you know, from the folk music scene to the to the rock and roll scene and to writing music and writing rock and roll songs. Yeah, because like when when you're in folk music in '62 or whatever, rock and roll is kind of out on the outskirts because the Beatles haven't been discovered yet, and on the radio, it's the teeny popper music and the Motown music is is finally getting, you know, huge exposure and all that stuff. So it was it, rock and roll was in a weird uh, space at that time, right? Right. Yeah, it was very poppy. You know, there wasn't a lot of soul to it, you know, except for some of that stuff. It was just coming coming out from from Detroit. Yeah. So it was it was a strange time, so it was only natural for people who were doing folk to transition into rock and roll and folk eventually became electric, you know, Dylan went electric by the time he did Blonde on Blonde. Right, exactly. Yeah. And Highway sixty one, uh, a little bit before that too. Um, so how does Big Brother and the Holding Company come about? Well, basically, um, uh, the, the founding members were myself, uh, Sam Andrew, mm -hmm. uh, a drummer named Chuck Jones. And Chuck and I lived at 1090 Page Street, and uh, there was a big ballroom downstairs that mostly was used by the people who lived there as a dining area. But it was um, originally some sort of a ballroom or, you know, a place where the, uh, the family would, would meet with guests and stuff. But it was very beautiful. It had uh, uh, redwood paneling, and it had two alcoves that were kind of like, um, uh, there was a couple of pillars and archways and stuff. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So just beautiful. So... Chet Helms, who was uh, my uh, brother's herb dealer, uh, asked him <laughs> if he could uh, uh, use the, the ballroom, you know, as a as a place for jam sessions on specifically Wednesday nights. This was 1965. Yeah. So um, uh, basically, Chuck, Sam, and myself were the were the basic um, rhythm section, I guess, you know. Yeah. Uh, if people didn't have uh, a bass player or a drummer, they would use us because uh, all our stuff was there, our equipment. Mm -hmm. So we drew from the Ada Ashbury, from the neighborhoods, and from outside also. And, and people like Garcia would, would come and, and uh, 
um, all sorts of people. Uh, some were really good, some were, were not, you know, but yeah. it was a whole learning process and, and jamming was, was um, I think, very educational for, for all of the folky type guys that, like myself, you know, we started learning about different uh, what, um, changes and, and uh, learning how to improvise. Um, it was only 75 cents, I think, at the high point. I think it started at 50 cents for, mm -hmm. for uh, admission. And you could buy Coke um, or 7-Up or something, you know, sort of drinks from, from yeah. chat out of the kitchen, which was down there, too. Um, and uh, it was a lot of fun. It, still, it, it got a little bit uh, outraged for some of the teens from the, the Sunset District coming in and kind of crashing it causing problems, but that was really right at the time that um, um, a lot of bands were getting together, and, uh, like the Warlocks and the Jefferson uh, Airplane, mm -hmm. uh, in different places. Mm -hmm. Now, the Warlocks never played 1090 Bay Street, but, you know, some of the members came in and jammed, mm -hmm. and because uh, we, we knew most of those people. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, that's the story about uh, 1090. It, it, it later uh, it, we just stopped doing it, and, and we started practicing a lot there in the basement. And Chet Helms brought in uh, James Gurley, who we knew from a, another group that you'd call the family, the family dog group. Oh yeah. Which was was uh, four four people from uh, that lived uh, on I think it was. Uh, um, now I'm, I'm blanking out on the street, Pine Street, yeah, Pine Street. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a commune, a house, and, and these people live there and, and across the street, and, and they got the idea of, of uh, trying to get um, uh, dances uh, happening in, in San Francisco. This was like after the, the Red Dog Saloon had, had opened, actually in, in uh, spring, I believe, of 65. And uh, one of the, the, the first original, I want to say, counterculture groups from San Francisco was the Charlton's, and they opened that club up in, in uh, Nevada City. Mm -hmm. No, Virginia City, excuse me. Virginia City in, in, uh, in Nevada. So uh, they were part of that scene, and, and uh, so they, they thought they could... Uh, promoters and uh, mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, it was kind of fun it was just uh, the first dance I can't remember where, when it was but it was at Long Sherman's Hall yeah uh, was uh, was Steve Miller around not at that time no not at that time <clears throat> yeah I'm a huge Steve Miller fan um, what, uh, so, so, so how long was it before Janice came in Mm hmm It was just and it was like we still were playing the, the the Red Dog every once in a while. And I think she did one weekend with us. Mm hmm And there was it was the different bands that would that uh, trade off the weekends. Um, I remember specifically May thirteenth I had my, my first daughter when she was born. Mm hmm um, on a Friday night, so I was already up there in Virginia City, and I got a call like about a one one o'clock in the morning. You know, we were getting off stage, and, and they said your, your wife is about ready to have a baby. So I hopped in my car and, and sped down to San Francisco. Uh, I saw my wife and the baby in the morning, and then hopped back in to, to play a, another uh, night at the, at the Red Dog. Mm -hmm. So this was a very memorable night. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of driving. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure when you first saw Janice, it was like lightning in a bottle. She had it right away. Yeah, pretty much so. I saw her during the folk day. She came up uh, from from Port Arthur, Texas, in '63, I believe. So I saw her at the. Um, uh, midnight special show, which was a, a radio show, 
But uh, I played there. I was sitting next to her. Uh, that was the first time I met I met her um, and heard heard her sing. She was very powerful. And um, my brother at the time was going to SF State and and did a couple of folk music festivals there. I don't remember the years exactly. Probably '63 and '64. And he had contracted her along with. Uh, um, uh, Larry Hanks and Roger Perkins to uh, like a trio to play there and she didn't show up they showed up but she failed to show up <laughs> she was kind of you know strung out a little bit you know just a funky chick um, but she could really sing and uh, so uh, I, you know when it came up that that we should probably get somebody else to do lead vocals because I, I, I did most of them um, and I was, I was limited. So uh, a lot of the bands in San Francisco were getting female vocalists. You know, uh, the Great Society, yeah. Grace Slick, and Airplane had uh, uh, um, Marty Bowen. Marty Bowen. I, I can't remember the the, the gal's name. Uh, I'm Gr- getting a little bit old, on the old side, so it's hard for me to remember a lot of these people. Uh, not, not Grace Slick, but. The, Grace Lick? Yeah, no, it was, um, um no, shoot, I'll, I'll remember. But anyway, mm-hmm. we thought we could have mm-hmm. a girl singer, too. And, and Chet had brought up uh, the name of, of uh, Janice because he had known her in Texas and had uh, actually brought her out, I guess, in 63, mm-hmm. hitchhike. Um, so, and I, so James Doyle had heard Janice and so had I and, and uh, all the, Sam and Chuck Jones didn't know who she was. Uh, we said, just bring her up, you know. I, I just put audition her, you know. At that time, I think by that time, Chuck Jones had been replaced by David Getz. Yeah. So uh, we were rehearsing uh, at uh, Elton Kelly and Mouse's uh, art studio on Henry Street. Had a little place that had a kind of a garage. Well, mm-hmm. it had been an old firehouse. Um, and uh, so when we, when she came in, she basically just kind of like joined the group. It was obvious that she she could really do do well with us. It's that the type of songs that she sang and and uh, the type of material that she brought into the group, but just her her whole vocal style was was. I mean, she hardly had, needed a microphone. She was being loud. <laughs> and we were a really loud band, you know, so it, it, uh, it, 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 and, uh, so, and we had auditioned a couple other, uh, uh, gals, Lynn Hughes, who used to work with the Charlton's a little mm-hmm. bit, mm-hmm. um, and, um, Mary Ellen, who later became a guitarist for the Ace of Cups, she auditioned for us too, uh, a couple others, I can't remember names, but, uh, yeah, uh, it was uh, Signe Tolley Anderson who was in Jefferson Airplane. That's right, yeah. Very yeah. Good. yeah, there you go. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and you guys made it all the way to Monterey Pop. How was that experience? Oh, yeah, that's probably, that's probably the most memorable of gigs that, you know, that I talk about. You know, when I get interviewed, you know, I, I always remember that one. Mm-hmm. And it was um, a fun gig. And a lot of people from San Francisco and, and uh, elsewhere, too, played on the gig, and, you know, like people from Europe, you know, um, Paris, Burton, and um, The Who. I never heard The Who before. I I heard of them, but I never heard their music. Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> that was quite a show. Yeah, it was quite a weekend. Very memorable. You know, had a great time. Yeah, what, what was the energy like in the crowd? Well, um, different than later, you know, and different than, than the ballroom scene because it was all sit down. As mm-hmm. a matter of fact, uh, I believe everybody had uh, a particular seat on their ticket. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it was, it was playing to a sitting crowd. You know, it was a pretty enthusiastic crowd, but different you know it's just kind of a changeover from from um uh, i want to 
want to say auditorium kind of venues where people, you know, would sit lightly and clap, you know, after. Yeah. You know, they wouldn't shout or anything. And then, you know, what, what happened in San Francisco was the, the dance concert concept where you could dance if you wanted to or sit down and watch the show as a concert. Mm -hmm. um, but usually it was very crazy and uh, uh, lots of energy. Uh, lots of uh, crazy people in crazy costumes doing crazy dances. Um, but the um, crowd at Monterey was a little more staid, and, and uh, I think in some cases they were kind of amazed, you know, mm -hmm. like the reaction that the Mama Cass had to, to Janice. And I was go, wow, I've never seen this before. And there was a lot of acts, like Jimi Hendrix, a lot of people said, oh, I never saw that. Well, particularly someone lighting their guitar on fire. <laughs> uh, that was, and the Who, you know, breaking up all of their equipment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even the, even the uh, sound people didn't know what to expect. You know, someone said that, oh, well, you got to watch your equipment when this band gets sunk. <laughs> so that you see in the movies, they're rushing out trying to save the microphones, you know. Mm -hmm. um, as um, Keith Moon is pushing over his drums after the smoke bomb exploded. Yeah. <laughs> that guy was a wild man for sure. Uh, yeah. But nothing insane happened there like in Altamont, say. No. No, it was always good vibes, you know? Yeah. It was a good vibe. That's good. So, you guys signed to um, Mainstream, and... Um, I was reading that uh, when you guys were recording that first album, you guys ran out of money and Bob Shad got, like, stranded in Chicago or something? Well, we were kind of stranded in Chicago. We asked Bob to, um, uh, you know, help us out, and he said, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good producer. <laughs> he was a jerk. You yeah. know, he's just a typical um, 50s producer wanting to get in and out of the studio as fast as possible. His, one of his, um, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, his lines to us was like, well, you guys got to get it before the, the 13th take, because 13 is unlucky and we're not going to go beyond that. We could go up to 12 and that's it. <laughs> so <laughs> we just had to do it our, our best. And it was like basically live recording there were some baffles and stuff, but there was no separation, mm -hmm. not hardly any overdub. So the only thing that he overdubbed was Janice's voice on almost every song. Yeah. He just, she just did set, you know, sang the same part. So, so it sounds like it's doubled. Yeah, it, it could have been worse, though. You could have had uh, Saul Zantz um, for, for a producer, and, and he would have taken all your money. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, he, uh, the mainstream guy was not that that dumb. He, he we were dumb. Yeah. So, well, you know, I, I need to get uh, fifty one percent of your publishing before we agree to do this recording. Ugh, and we signed that that contract. You know, that was terrible. Yeah. So that, that... years afterwards, you know, he would always try to. You know, he would be collecting money, you know, and not get, giving us our share. Mm. Oh, my God. Well, yeah. it would take a long time for us to get our share, let's put it that way. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. It really is. But yeah. th there's some great tunes on that first album, like Down On Me. I love that yeah. song. That was like a freedom song in the in the 20s. Was that, was that like a, a song that Janice really liked? Yeah, she liked it. She had never heard it before. We, we had done the song ourselves, you know, I was doing lead on that, and it was basically mm -hmm. a song that we had heard on a uh, um, uh, compilation of, uh, uh, I want to say, uh, on-location recordings. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, oh, God, I'm blanking out on, on the people who did it. Father and Son. Um yeah, um, I haven't drunk on any coffee this morning, and I should have had a lot to get my get my juices flowing and my memory cells going. Um, I'll probably remember the 
later. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we listened to a lot of older recordings and, and, and took them and kind of like uh, modernized them and the different harmonies and, and of course playing electric music by them. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe down on me, you can, you can find that, I think, um, uh, on YouTube. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Blind Man is another one that I sang, and I still sing it once in a while. And that was also from those recordings. Oh, gosh. I'm kind of blanking out on the name. It's very famous collectors who go down with a, a tape recorder in the trunk of their car, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, bring in their equipment to churches and into uh, various halls and... and um, there was, I think a lot of recordings that were done, you know, like down by the river, you know, where the women are washing their clothes with, you know, with rocks, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and singing, singing mournful gospel type songs, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I exaggerate, but uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. So with them. Um... Janice, Janice, like, added words, she added lyrics, you know, Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, she was a she was a true artist, you know. Yeah. Um, but when you guys did treat cheap thrills, that was uh, that was already at Columbia, right? Yeah. After after we did the, the Monterey Pop Festival, uh, Clive Davis got interested in us and, and started talking to our manager, and um, Janice was a little pissed off that our manager didn't allow us to be photographed mm -hmm. or, or filmed, I mean, um, on the Saturday performance that we had. And uh, Albert Grossman, who... Bob Dylan's there, manager. Yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob Dylan's manager. Also the manager of the Poppers and Paul Butterfield, blues band who played there. Yeah. Um, he, he took her aside and said, you know, you guys should really... Um, Trying to get filmed here. Of this, you know, the the movie was was presented to us like as we we're like walking up the stairs to the stage. You know, we we're handed these these releases, and we said, "What's this? What's this?" He said, "Oh, oh, uh, we're filming the show, mm -hmm. and this this uh, will you know uh, allow us to film you, and you you know get paid something." We said, "No, <laughs> that's ridiculous." And the Grateful Dead said the same thing, and so the Quicksilver Messenger Service, you know, it was just not the way you do it. You know, present us paperwork way beforehand, not just as we're walking up on the stage. Mm -hmm. So we told everybody, all the film crew, to put their cameras, face them, face them down to the ground. You cannot film us. So um, after our show, everyone said, well, you should have been filmed, <laughs> <laughs> particularly Grossman. And, and uh, so... He he bent Janice's ear, and then she, she came over to us and, and bent our ear, and we kind of agreed. And Grossman said, "I think I can get you on on tomorrow night's show, Sunday night show. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just maybe a couple of songs, but you'll be filmed, you know." Yeah. So um, our manager at the time was vehemently against it, but we he kind of over. Wrote his uh, his opinion and said, "No, we have to do this. It will help out a great deal." And it certainly did. You know, we, Janice particularly got a lot of a lot of uh, press. Yeah. And um, even today, you know, when there's ever anything about Janice, there's always that footage of her singing uh, "Ball and Chain" from the from the uh, Monterey Pop Festival. Mm -hmm. So uh, that. Um, and, and we had already had recorded this uh, mainstream record, but it hadn't been released yet. So after we started getting a lot of press, then Bob Shad released the album and without without really coming back to us and letting us maybe redo things, you know, make things better. He just put it out. Mm -hmm. And that, that was in the, the fall of 66. Uh, yeah. So... Then Grossman, we went with him as, as our manager and started talking to uh, Clive Davis at Columbia. And 
Davis, I guess, it was talking to mainstream, trying to buy, and finally did buy the contract. Uh, but it cost us, uh, as a band, as a, for our first royalties, it cost $100,000. It also cost Columbia $100,000, so it was a $200,000 deal. Mm -hmm. So later you'll see the, the mainstream record with, with the, uh, the various Columbia logos on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, do you guys think that you were better at covers than, than writing your own songs? That's a good question. Um, I guess the question is, are our songs better than the cover songs? And, and probably the answer to that is, is no. The cover songs, we liked them when we did them because we thought they were better than what we were writing. Mm -hmm. But... Um, Everyone in the band realized that you know, if you write your own material, you know you you, you get double you know royalties. Mm -hmm. Not only as royalties as a performer, but as, as a writer, and particularly if you have your own publishing company, that's even another way of getting money. Yeah, so that's what we did. So there's some songs that that uh, I really think are are very characteristic of the band. Mm. That are that are good songs, um, and Janice's, you know, um, "Women of the Losers" song. Uh, I like that a lot. Oh yeah, I mean, P "Piece of My Heart" and "Ball and Chain" and um, "Summertime." Just great, just just great songs. You know, you guys were really good at making covers your own too. Yeah, we tried to do that. We we what, what we called brother, big brotherized them. <laughs> Take a song and, and mash it up, you know. Yeah. <laughs> now I know that uh, Janice uh, was a big fan of R. Crumb, uh, but how how did uh, he um, end up uh, designing the cover of the album? Well, she just went over to his house and said, "Can you, you know, give us front and back album cover for this new release that we're that we have that's coming out on Columbia?" You know, and so he gave. Um, he gave us some thought, and uh, I didn't think we we didn't tell him how to do anything. You know, he's just a crazy guy. Yeah. And uh, we thought he turned out something really good. So Janice came back uh, after he had completed his um, designs with these two um, cardboard mock-ups. Mm -hmm. One was the front side and one was the back side. So the front side was uh, a picture of us gone in, I want to say like matchstick cartoon style mm -hmm. with photograph heads. Uh, and we were playing on stage and there was a funny crowd in front of us. Um, and it looked like something from a, a, a 50s yearbook, you know, real corny. <laughs> and, and but then we looked at the at the at the uh, back cover, and we said, "Well, this is really terrific. You know, it has all the songs, and it has, you know, characters of the band. Uh, we're gonna use that as the front cover. And um, sorry, Robert, we can't use that front other front uh, thing that you did. No, and that's not gonna work. So that's how that happened. Yeah. And uh, Columbia liked it, but they they changed a couple uh of well, one thing in particular that which we didn't like we did a song called Harry mm -hmm. and on the album cover you can see that on the left hand side there's a little man with a uh, um, uh, what do you call it he looks like a seat or something you know yeah. um, and, and um, the song was, uh, was kind, of, kind, of, kind of like um, uh, how would you it, it, it was very weird improvised thing and it only lasted for like less than a minute mm -hmm. and and the whole band basically wrote it with but basically Dave said you know it was the concept was, was from Dave uh, it was a rhythm song and uh, they didn't like it um, and they left it off the album mm -hmm. the only way that you can hear that is on the the uh, uh, Sex Dope and Cheap Thrills released that came out in 2018. 
which mm. has a lot of alternate takes. Oh, yeah, that's the one I bought from your table. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, did you like that? Did you listen to that? I, yeah, I, yeah, I loved it. I just thought that it was a, um, it was a scrapbook of just, you know, that point in time. Kind of shows like the development of certain songs, mm-hmm. or how, in some ways, certain uh, songs were cut. Uh, I mean, like shortened. Um, yeah. Particularly the song that I did, which was originally the Cuckoo, which was on the mainstream record. It had a really long guitar solo that I did, mm-hmm. and uh, Bob Shad did not like that. He, he wanted to keep everything under like two and a half minutes. Yeah. So uh, when we did the, the Chief Thrills record, we decided we'd do that again, but we renamed the song called Oh Sweet Mary mm-hmm. uh, and include a, a, <coughs> the uh, guitar solo. That was basically the, the cuckoo solo. So on the, the recording that you bought, I think there's like two versions of Oh Sweet Mary on there. Yes. And they're long. Yeah, they're not that great. I mean, I I I, I like the fact that, that uh, the producer cut cut the time on on uh, the final version of it that uh, was on the uh, cheap thrills. But uh, yeah, all all these re, all these expanded reissue albums. I don't think they would be out if if it hadn't been for the Beatles anthology. You know, they, that really led the way for everyone to release all these expanded albums, you know, the Rolling Stones had one for Exile on Main Street with all the songs that were left off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, those were the days, you know, when we first recorded with Main Street, those were the days when songs didn't last much longer than three minutes. Yeah. So when... And we were uh were treading new ground as well as other bands from San Francisco in in very extended solos. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and crazy stuff, you know, wild. Yeah, the best I think was uh, Country Joe and the Fish, the first record. Yeah, who you later uh, joined, right? Yeah, yeah. That uh, they they were a very avant garde band that didn't sound like any any of their contemporaries. And you know, when you hear a song like Section Forty Three. I mean, you really have to be under some kind of a hallucinogenic to get into that song. It's so, it's so strange. <laughs> you know? Something, yes. <laughs> yeah. Make it even more, you know, far out, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they were like an acquired taste kind of a band. Yeah, yeah, Space you know. Strange is another one. It's, 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 um... Yeah. <laughs> So when Jen, well, you know, there was a lot of bands like that that would do things um, that were, you know, usually including extended solos and rhythm changes and whatever. Uh, and a lot of them did not, you know, uh, get on record just simply because the, the producer said, "Ah, this is just too long. This is boring or whatever." You know? mm-hmm. um, I think that the first Grateful Dead record, you know, was was a lot of covers. If I remember correctly. Yeah. They, yeah, they, uh, they, 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 they never thought that they had done a really good studio record because they couldn't jam like they did on stage. But I think American Beauty is the closest they ever got to it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and maybe the one they did before that. Um, but I definitely think American Beauty is the big highlight as far as studio goes for them. Yeah, yeah. But what? Um, so when Janice left, it, it must have hurt you guys in terms of touring and getting exposure. Well, uh, before she left, we did a lot of a lot of touring, a lot of shows, and uh, mm-hmm. made a lot of friends and a lot of fans and whatever. And there were fans that would that would go on to be just Janice fans, you know, to, to support her uh, first band, the Cosmic Blues Band. Mm-hmm. Um. But there were still a lot of uh, people that liked us, you know, liked the band, even though we did not get good press reviews, particularly mm-hmm. in the East Coast. Mm-hmm. They would say, you know, Janice is just way above the, the musicianship of the, of the 
the, uh, the members of the band and, and that she should probably, you know, go and seek other people to play, you know, mm-hmm. back her up. And actually, that was kind of like uh, Grossman's, um, even though we didn't have a conversation with him specifically about this, but mm-hmm. uh, I mean, I, I know that he didn't think much of uh, us as, as musicians. As a matter of fact, one of the first live recordings that we did was at the Grandy Ballroom, and after he got the tapes and listened to them, he brought us all into his office in New York mm-hmm. and said, you know, we <laughs> can't use this. Number one, everything's bleeding, and uh, there's no separation, and and mistakes are, are, are made by you guys every once in a while, and it bleeds over to the other track. And it just gets messy, and uh, I... And he was really, just, and this is so weird, because here's everybody in the band, and he said, you know, I think Dave and Peter probably should be replaced on the recordings that you do next. Mm. We all looked at each other and go, what? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> now, even Janice going, what? You know, and for, for me, of course, uh, uh, hindsight, you know, I, I knew that he had gotten... Uh, the band specifically to get Janice. He didn't want us. He, he wanted Janice, and he got Janice. Mm-hmm. But he was he was he was out front about it. He did not like the way that we played. We played at the Mon- at the uh, Newport Folk Festival. We played a short set of about four four or five songs, and I think mm-hmm. um, <clears throat> "Peace of My Heart" was the last one, and the crowd went nuts. I mean, mm-hmm. they really, really like this. And, and so we came back on and did a kind of what's called a reprise of that song, Peace My Heart, and then got off backstage. And, and Grossman, along with his wife, you know, said to me and Dave, come here, I want to talk to you through it behind in some tent. You know, he says, you guys just really weren't holding it together. And I, go, I said, what? Because you guys are just, you know, you're all over the place with the rhythm and stuff. And, yeah. And I go, what? So, uh, yeah, he was laying it out to us, and so I, I kind of like figured in my mind, this, this is not going to bode well here for the, for the uh, existence of this band with Janis Joplin. Yeah. Uh, How hard was it for you when Janis passed? It was, it was very difficult for me because I felt it like we're family. Yeah. Even though we hadn't really been together for more than... We, were, we had been together for less than two years mm-hmm. at that time. And, um, uh, but I, you know, we had played so much together. We had, you know, Janison and, and some of the members of the band, not myself, you know, we're very, very close, if you know what I mean. Yeah. If you get my, if you get my drift. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, there was, there was sex, there was drugs, there was crazy drunkenness, there was, you know, and we lived together mm-hmm. for about half a year in Lagunitas. I mean, I felt like it was a close knit family, even though it was only maybe a year and a half or year two three quarters. But uh, still, I was pissed off. You know, mm-hmm. I told her that, and I said, "You're breaking up this family." Yeah. I said, "I know that you want your own career, but you know, and you could probably do your own solo stuff if you wanted to." But and then she said, "No, I want a different band." I want a horn band. Yeah. And, you know, Sam kind of agreed with her, you know, and uh, James didn't say much. Dave said, well, I, I, I knew this was coming. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, so um, we did this one last part of this tour because we got this message when we were in New York, we were staying at the Chelsea Hotel. And um, so we just continued to work, and it was difficult uh, a couple of times. It was uh, difficult emotionally to, to go on stage and do this. And, and I was starting to like really not like what some of the things Janice was doing. Yeah. Particularly in, in, in goading the audience to clap more. She would sometimes go out after, you know, like looking for an encore, you know. Yeah. What you do as a musician is it, it, you graciously go backstage after your last song, and if they really want you, you'll know it. Mm-hmm. You know, but like, there was a couple of times when she went 
out on stage before, you know, you really knew that they won an encore and was like waving her hands and said, come on, give me more, give me more, you know. Yeah. And then we'd go out and, and play an encore, but it, it wasn't, it wasn't real fun, you know. Yeah. Do you, do you ever think about what she could have done if she had uh, survived? Yeah, I I think that uh, she could have done some interesting recordings, you know. Mm. Uh, I think that she was a pretty good writer, but I think that she would have to probably get together with some people who are really good writers and uh, uh, do stuff that's like, like, like really typically... Janice, but you know, she was picking some good songs, and there were some good writers who gave her some good material. Mm-hmm. Half Moon is one of those songs that I really like. Um, and and Sam, you know, helped, and and he went with the group for for uh, a short while. The uh, Cosmic Blues Band uh, mm-hmm. um, when they went to Europe and um, other tours, but he didn't play Woodstock. She played Woodstock with the Cosmic Blues Band, but with Don Till playing guitar. And yeah. uh, that was kind of unfortunate. I mean, it, it set him off into a, a weird direction. And James had been set off in a weird direction anyway. He's a weird guy to begin mm-hmm. with. But uh, they were both uh, users of uh, Schmeck, as the first one would call it. <laughs> yeah. But, and, um, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but, There's more stories about that. I want to go into that. That's, that's weird, weird shit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, kind of negative stuff. But uh, yeah, but the band sounded well, even even though some of these guys were kind of bloated, you know. Yeah. Played play the parts right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, everything came together, synergy. But leading up to the pandemic, though, I mean, you never stopped playing. Well, we did stop playing. Uh, we stopped playing in 69. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Dave and I uh, tried to get the band back together. We still had the, uh, this uh, uh, great rehearsal space, mm-hmm. Golden Gate Street in the city, and we got uh, Dave Nelson, who was a you know, friend of mine from high school, and David Torbert, who uh, Nelson had played with in, in, a, in a, a band down in Scotts Valley or Santa Cruz. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember the name of the band, doggone it. But anyway, it was a good band. And, and uh, they were up in the Ren and, uh, or San Francisco at the time. And mm-hmm. they came over and, and we tried to get this band together. And I started playing guitar again. Mm-hmm. I, I generally had quit playing guitar for the most part. But uh, um, David Torbert was a really good play, bass player. And then later, you know, of course, they did... They, they became the new writers of the Purple Sage. Yeah. With, uh, John, with John Dawson. So uh, in, the, in the midst of getting, trying to get the band back together, we get this call from Country Joe McDonald saying that his rhythm section had left. Mm-hmm. He, and he had a tour, a big tour, like a two month tour of Europe. And uh, would, would Dave and I like to go and do this? So we, we uh, opted out for that. That was, I think, the early part of 69 um, or halfway, I can't remember exactly, but we did that for a couple of months, came back, and uh, uh, the rest of the, the country show band uh, hmm. hung around in, in New York, I guess, to do some recording. We, Dave and I did some recording on a record called Here We Go Again. Yeah. And then um, uh, they stayed, and we came back, and uh, Country Joe got, uh, uh, who did he get now? Doug Metzler on bass, and uh, Dewey, I can't remember his first name. Mm -hmm. Duke Dewey is what we call him. And they played uh, Woodstock in 69. Yeah. So we were involved in that. And uh, anyway, we got uh, uh, James back and, and Sam back. Mm-hmm. He had been fired. So uh, we started looking for uh, vocalists. We got Nick Rabinitis. Mm-hmm. And later on, we got Kathy McDonald. So that band lasted until about 72. Mm-hmm. 
and, and various different people playing, you know, in and out of the band. Even I, you know, didn't play some gigs with them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, uh, gosh, yeah, a number of different people. But the, uh, one, one version was really good with Nick and Mike Finnegan playing, mm -hmm. playing uh, organ and, and piano. He was incredible, incredible. And it really sounded good. And we did some recordings uh, uh, with Nick. Uh, the first one was one that he produced called Be a Brother. Mm -hmm. And then the, the second one, uh, Big Brother said without Janice was How Hard It Is. And that had a variety of different songs. I mean, really kind of all over the place. Yeah, Sh Shine On, I like that song. Yeah, yeah, it's really different. Uh, yeah. All the songs are kind of different. And uh, Kathy is, is, sings well on that, and, and, and Finnegan had done a great version of Buried Alive in the Blues, which is the last song that Janice was supposed to record on her Pearl record, I guess it's called. Yeah. I never got around to doing the lyrics, and it was just recorded as an instrumental. But when we did it, we had Mike Finnegan singing, singing lead, and he just did a fantastic job. But you'll never hear it because the manager said, "Well, you're only staying my studio time, money. He's not part of the band, so forget it. You're not going to use this. It's too good." Yeah. So at some place in the in the vaults at uh, Columbia or Sony, it's a great version of that song, um, and an important song. And later we we did that song. Uh, uh, with or without Nick singing it, he was the writer. Mm -hmm. So we stopped playing in, in 72. Uh, I started working uh, as a, uh, oh gosh, what do you call it? Just a, 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 um, an assistant uh, uh, to a first grade class. <laughs> In, oh, you were uh, assistant teacher, yeah. Yeah, I was a, I was a teacher for a while there. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. Is that okay? My arm was getting tired. Oh, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that for a couple, three years. I worked at a, a, um, a hobby shop for a short while, mm -hmm. playing gigs sometimes at night with various people. I had a band in the mid '70s called the Out of Hand Band, mm -hmm. which was mostly the Out of Work Band. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we played Moody's Irish Pub on Grand Avenue in the city almost like uh, at least once a month. Yeah, if not more. Uh, and that was a good band. Chuck Day uh, was the guitar player. He was very good. Anyway, um, the band. Big Brother got back together for one gig in 1978. It was called uh, Tribal Stomp Number no. Two. It was mm -hmm. put on by Chet Helms at the uh, Greek Theater in Berkeley. Yeah. And uh, there's a movie there someplace. I, I, the guy who produced the movie has since passed away, and now we're going mean, to have to try to find somebody to find the tapes, yeah. they find the reels, you know, or film, I, I think it was tape. Anyway, um, so that lasted just, that was just a reunion for, for one gig, for one, one day. And then uh, uh, I joined again uh, the Country Joe band. Yep. And that lasted a couple you know, small tours. Yeah, do you guys um, even... You even had a small part in American uh, Graffiti, the second one, with them. Right, right. More American Graffiti. One of the worst movies ever made. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> terrible. Terrible. Yeah. But I got, I got to be friends with Doug Stom. You know, Doug is, is a guy that we had played on the St. Bell de Avalon a couple of times. A great guy. Uh, and he lived in the ring for a while, a baseball nut, and really mm -hmm. nice guy. And he was in that movie, and that, uh, so... We're on the, the Country Joe band is on stage for like one song. I guess yeah. it's fixing the direct so I'm not that big. I'm not sure. Yeah. Anyway, so in in uh, eighty, basically not much happening. You know, I can't I can't tell you what I did except uh, mm. I started working uh, as a uh, uh, 
um, production guy at a company that made miniatures for architectural modelers. Mm -hmm. And um, that became a, a manager of handling, receiving, and shipping. Uh, and my wife worked there, even my daughter worked there for a short while. Mm -hmm. And um, in 87, uh, the, the Big Brother Band wanted to get back together again. Everybody had, had, had done their individual musical trips and yeah. and they weren't working out financially. And we, you know, we thought, well, this is you know, coming up to the 40th anniversary of this and that, or it was the 25th anniversary, I guess it. So let's get together and, and actually the guy that wanted us to get together was Matthew Cates, who had managed Moby Drake. He was a really kind of a jerky kind of guy, yeah. the manager, you know. I, I, I didn't particularly care for the guy, but he said he had a point. He said, well, you know, if, if, uh, if there's these uh, 25th and 30th reunions, you guys got to gotta be there, you know. Mm -hmm. So we, we started getting back together in 87. But in the meantime, in 82, I got together with uh, um, Barry Melton, uh, Spencer Dryden, mm -hmm. Don Cipollina, uh, Bob Hunter, and uh, Merle Saunders. And mm -hmm. it was a group called Dinosaurs. <laughs> and we did about maybe four or five gigs a year, you know. Yeah. About almost 10 years. Mm-hmm. It was fairly successful. We made one album, which was okay, mm -hmm. but uh, it was basically sideman, you know, doing sideman stuff and trying to do leads and stuff. It was okay. And uh, Barry, you know, sings pretty well. He did most of the vocals. Yeah, I've talked. To, anyway, I've, I've talked to Mario Kibolina. He's a great guy. Mario, yeah. Yeah. He's still in these days. I haven't talked. I haven't seen him. Talked to him or anything. Uh, he's got himself a woman, and he's he's not doing much these days. Well, he, was, he was married and had kids, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we, t we, we talked a lot about, you know, Huey Lewis in the news and stuff like that. Uh, right. Not not so much about the present, but I know he's got a woman, and he's doing pretty good. You know, just, you know, not doing much these days, I guess. <clears throat> but it's funny you mentioned John Dawson before. I, I interviewed this Australian filmmaker named Michael Rubo, and uh, he went to Stanford, and he rented a room with uh, uh, John Dawson's parents. And John uh, hung around, and Jerry Garcia hung around. He said one time they went up to the hate, and they had an acid trip with uh, Ken Kesey. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. it get stoned? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was just uh, an awesome, legendary story there. Uh, yeah. Did, did you know Hoagie Forrester? That's a ring a bell. Okay, I've interviewed her. She's an actress. Uh, she was a dancer in the 60s. She, um, her mother owned a boutique, a boutique um, in San Francisco that um, Janis Joplin used to go to. And um, she hung out with her for a while when um, when she was first in Big Brother and the Holding Company, and she has great memories of going to see you guys. Uh, well, Janice was very close with uh, Peggy Caserta from Nazeticus, which was on Hate Street. Mm -hmm. Wow. And she was friends with some people. I think they had a store on Polk Street. Yeah. So that might have been, might have been that one. Yeah. yeah. So, so you must be worried about the future of um, live music with this pandemic going on. Well, I tell you, we had some good gigs uh, this month back east that were canceled uh, a long time ago, of course, yeah. with the Yardbirds and, and some other English band. And it was going to be outside, you know, a municipal gig where it's free, you know, like, yeah. you know, town or city or county was paying for it. I, I love those kinds of gigs because it's always full of people. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, they were not necessarily fans of the bands, but they said, oh, it's free, play, well, it's cool, we'll go check them out. You know, see, see what we missed, you know, when we were too stoned to go to a show. So anyway, and we had played with the, the uh, Yardbirds at one point, um, 
in Italy where I did, at a festival. We did say the same night. But anyway, good people. And, and they were very influential uh, to uh, Big Brother's music. Mm -hmm. Early stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as like the gigs go, I mean, we, we've lost a, a, a quite a few. And uh, we did do, though, a, uh, a pay-per-view kind of thing. I mean, it was supposed to be a live um, internet thing that you paid five bucks. You know, yeah. And you could see the show that we did at 19 Broadway. And that was, what, last Saturday? Mm-hmm. Uh, or two Saturdays ago. Um, and there were some technical problems and some monetary problems, so it wasn't live, but it is on, on record, so you can go and see. It's going to be shown on, uh, go to musee.com, M-U-S-A-E.com, and you can uh, find out when it's going to be. The first showing is uh, October 10th. October 10th. And that's with... Um, our complete West Coast band, I call it, because we change members sometimes when we go back east. Yeah. So this includes uh, Tom Finch, who's been with us for over 20 years now. Mm -hmm. Harvey Gould, a uh, great singer. He used to sing with the Jefferson Starship. Mm -hmm. uh, and David Aguilar, and, and uh, David Getz and myself. Awesome. That's uh, October 10th, five bucks, we'll get you a show, you know, on, on your computer. Awesome, awesome. Oh, that, that's... You can pay a little bit more money for some sort of a device, uh, 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 thing like a, a pair of glasses or something. It's a, it holds your telephone, and <laughs> you can do, get an app and you get a DVD. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Finch, he said, I had to try this, so I, I bought one, and I, I started looking. And he said, it made, made me dizzy, you know, and got vertigo. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. Uh, That's great. And, uh, yeah, so that's at least something, you know. I, and yeah. I haven't played, besides that, really, I haven't played much uh, um, this year. Uh, my neighbor across the street here in El Cerrito is a good guitar player, and his, and his wife is a drummer. Mm -hmm. So I opened up my garage and got my equipment out, and I, I played to him, who was playing on the street, across the street. Mm -hmm. We did three songs. People just walk by and go, what the hell is going on? <laughs> it's all out of sync. There's no monitors. You know, we're just playing a lot of stuff. Funny. Yeah. Is your, is your birthday June 6th? Yes, it is. That's my birthday, too. You're kidding me. Nope. Oh, my God. Tommy, you belong to a, a crew of, I mean, a group of like five or six people that I know that are born that day. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, the great musician Dwight Twilley was born on that day. Really? Yeah. Really? Yep. Interesting. There was a guy who did uh, MC work at the Avalon Ballroom named The Buddha from Muir Beach. He was also born on that day. Huh. Yeah. I mean, um, Dean Martin was June 7th, and Prince was June 7th, and a couple other people. But, yeah, I'm, I, I take a lot of pride in my 6th, 6th birthday. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, <clears throat> I was born on the original... June 6th, 1944, D-Day. That was D-Day, 44? Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> My father did a, a, a birth announcement. He was into printing, uh, as a <clears throat> journalist, he was a writer and whatever. Mm -hmm. And he, he wrote up a little uh, uh, document that was taken from the headlines of the San Francisco Chronicle in big black bull letters, letters that said, Invasion, you know, and it had the date and San Francisco Chronicle you know, logo on top. And then he goes on to say that I invaded the Alvin household at 5.30 a.m., you know. And mm -hmm. It went on, and it's kind of funny. My weight and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Peter... It's I... funny. I, I've been kind of associated with, with that. I mean, I, I, I felt like, mm -hmm. mm, you know, there's, there's something about being born on a day when something very um, important happened. Um not my birth, but, but invading Europe to get get freedom for all these people who lost it to the Nazis. Yeah. 
Well, Peter, I thank you so much for coming on today, and you you have an awesome wife. How long have you two been together for? Oh, God, way over 30 years. I think I can't remember how many years. Since about 80, 89. Oh, wow. Well, I thank her so much uh, for reconnecting us because I had lost your card, you know, after I oh, got you right. from you. Yeah. 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 And you were just an amazing 1,000th guest. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Tommy. And, and uh, you know, anytime you want to give me a call and do another one, talking about other subjects or whatever, you know. Sure, sure. That would be I'm great. Yeah. But um, have fun with those virtual uh, concerts, and stay safe because we need you, and have yourself a great day. Same with you, Tommy. Thanks for calling, man. My pleasure. Have a good one. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Peter Albin. Ain't he a cool dude? Oh, what a very nice guy, humble guy great stories about the groovy 60s psychedelic scene of San Francisco. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, add me as a friend on Facebook, join my Tommy Kovac Comedian page on Facebook, follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes!